Hey everybody, this is TJR. This video is a follow-up to the video that I posted last week, which was actually a response video to the video that Rick Beato originally posted entitled, Why Gen Z is Not Into Music. Was that confusing enough of an intro? Because if it wasn't, I can definitely try harder. <laughs> Anyways, um, in his original video, he primarily discussed video games as the reason why Gen Z is not as into music as, say, the boomer generation, the generation that he and I grew up in. And while I agree that it's true that the status that music once had in our popular culture has definitely declined, I don't think video games are the sole culprit nor do I think that all of this should be laid at the feet of Gen Z. I think all existing generations have become more disconnected from music over the last couple of decades, and that there are several big cultural forces that I could point to that have played a part in this. And in my earlier video, I did briefly outline what I felt some of those cultural forces were, but primarily, I discussed in depth the topic of almost endless and unlimited choices that we currently have versus what existed when Rick Beato and I were teenagers. Now, I will leave a link for that earlier video, uh, but today, in this video, I'm going to discuss those other topics. Here are the seven cultural forces that I feel contributed to the declining status of music in our popular culture. Heaven help me, this is already sounding like a David Letterman top 10. Hello, this is TJR, and this video is brought to you by my patron supporters. If you would like to show your support for these kinds of videos, please go to patreon.com forward slash TJR, the original, and make a pledge. Patron supporters receive early access to select videos and also receive exclusive videos available nowhere else. And if you can't become a patron supporter, I understand. You can help this channel grow by just clicking like and letting this video play till the very end so that the YouTube algorithm recognizes me and recommends these videos to more viewers like you. Also click subscribe and click the bell icon so you never miss a video. Thank you for your support. Number one, radio and the narrowing of playlists. Before the internet, radio was the key. Radio was the doorway to music discovery, and it was the platform that helped build music careers. Growing up in Southern California during the 1970s, we had the FM rock radio station KMET that allowed its DJs to program their own shows. This led to a lot of music getting exposed that otherwise would not have. Until, of course, program directors began taking over what was and what wasn't allowed on the air. And the DJ playlist started to narrow, which is sadly what happens to all radio eventually. Now, I don't know what radio was like living in other states or other countries, but I kind of suspect that if you lived during that same time as Rick Beato and I did, uh, this would be the 70s, uh, your local radio may have gone through a similar period of experimentation before getting co-opted. But I do know there was this time when FM radio was wildly innovative compared to its AM radio counterpart. In time, FM rock radio became classic rock radio. I remember the first of them in Southern California was KLSX in Los Angeles. Their tagline was, you know every song we play. Back then, a lot of my contemporaries would say, oh, I love this station. And that's because they knew every song they played. Every song they played was a hit that they were already familiar with. There was nothing new. But I knew then that this was the death knell for FM rock radio. Gone was the experimentation. Gone was the deep cuts. And I hate to say this. I have to bring this down on my own generation. But it turned the majority of my generation, the boomers, it turned us into Pavlov dogs, exchanging instant gratification 
over the adventure of experiencing something new. The same thing also happened with the upstart radio station KROQ, which was also in Los Angeles, which started to break big in the late 70s and early 80s and was responsible for exposing us to a lot of what would later be called New Wave. And this station also allowed its DJs to program their own music until they no longer did and went the way of all corporate radio. All across the radio spectrum, uh, the top 100 started to give way to the top 50, which gave way to the top 40, and in some cases, the top 20 and the top 10. This narrowing of playlists was the result of radio station programmers becoming fearful that listeners might turn away from the station if they heard something that didn't sound familiar to them, if they didn't hear something that they already knew and liked. The idea being that the more familiar everything is, the less likely you, the listener, are going to turn away. Now, the answer to that is to play less new stuff. And if you do play something new, make sure it doesn't sound too much different from what you're already playing on the station. This, of course, created a climate where radio stations are playing all the same hit songs as everyone else. Now, I did study broadcasting in the late 80s. I DJed at the local college radio station. I also did an internship at KLOS, which is a major LA radio station that I believe still exists to this day. Not 100% sure because I just don't pay attention to radio anymore. And I did briefly work at an AM radio station, only to realize that this wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. But it was during this time that I saw the climate that I'm currently describing starting to, to take shape. And this climate led to a sameness, a homogeneity in how radio stations would decide what songs would get airplay and what songs wouldn't. For a long time now, it has felt to me that songs get chosen for airplay, not because of quality, but because of how much they sounded like every other song currently playing. I can trace this all the way back to the mid to late 80s. Um, I personally have not been able to listen to radio for decades now. And this doesn't mean that good songs don't make it through. They do from time to time. And when we get like a really honest song that is, you know, conveying some really, something really human, a good example would be uh, like Rumor Has It by Adele or Happy by Pharrell. Um, the public just reacts insanely. Uh, and, and I say that in a good way. Uh, they act as though they've been starved. Um, well, they, I guess they have been really, but they act like people who have been basically starved on a diet of jello and then are suddenly given superfoods to eat. To quote the band Rush, glittering prizes and endless compromises have definitely shattered the illusion of integrity. Secretly, though, I've always wanted to believe that Queen was right, though, that radio had yet to have its finest hour. But with the dawn of streaming, I think more and more stations will switch over to talk formats. But you never know. Who would have thought that vinyl would overtake CD sales? Something exciting could still happen to incite even jaded former listeners like myself to tune in again for the music. Next is MTV. It's been said that video killed the radio star. And maybe this is true. But personally, I love music videos. I've always loved them. In fact, before music videos existed, I would imagine my own music videos in my head whenever I listen to songs. But with all that said, if you were trying to break into the biz during the MTV era, it was easy to see how much music videos created an atmosphere of style over substance, where how you looked became not only as important, but even more important than how well you played, and even more important than how good your songwriting was. For me personally, one of the most frustrating moments of this time came for me while answering an ad in Music Connection magazine for a band that was signed to a label and needed a guitarist. Uh, I called for an interview and I was extensively interrogated over the phone about my appearance and asked to describe my looks in just excruciating detail. I was getting very annoyed with this line of questioning. And I told the interview that I had often been told by other musicians that I looked a lot like guitarist Steve Vai, who at that time was well known 
for playing in the David Lee Roth band. I was then asked, do you look better than him? To which I responded, what if I could play better than him? I never got an answer to that question because by this time I was so angry that I just hung up the phone. Now, in spite of what I've just said, we did get some great artists during the MTV era, no doubt about it. But we also got a whole lot of what I refer to as the shallow end as well. And it's this shallow end that I began to see continue to pro proliferate and grow in the ensuing decades. Again, I don't want to see music videos go away. I think they are great. I think they have great potential. And I think they're also great at breaking new artists. I also want to say that I do see signs of improvement. In the early 2000s, I had a conversation with a small record label owner who said, regarding the current mainstream at the time, we don't have female artists anymore. We have models that sing. Now, this has changed currently, and I'm glad to see that. You don't need to be model perfect anymore to have a music career. Also, I want to add that advances in technology have made it easier and more affordable for all artists to be able to make their own music videos. The next topic is file sharing, and this is the one that I will get a lot of flack for bringing up in this video, but I will never back down from this position. File sharing did help to devalue music. Over the decades, I have heard every counter argument explaining how file sharing didn't hurt anyone, no one lost their jobs over it, and I can counter every single one of those arguments. I could do a whole video where all I do is counter every single argument that I've ever heard over the last couple of decades, but I won't get into that here because we wouldn't go home. Instead, I will just say that when people found out they could get music for free, they just stopped valuing it. It's as simple as that. Now, file sharing isn't really as big of a thing as it was. It still exists, but uh, we have streaming now. And I think a lot more people have just found that streaming is just easier. Uh, you get better quality. You don't have to worry about infecting your computer. It still exists, but it's not as big of a thing as it probably once was. But during its time, it did help to devalue music in the eyes of the general public. And I think that those effects are residual, even after the fact. The next is everybody's favorite TV show, American Idol. I used to say American Idol is great for TV but bad for music. And I'll still say that to this day. Simon Cowell, who was the creator of American Idol, took music and he put the entire emphasis on the vocalist. During his tenure, this series continually reinforced the message that to be a great music artist, you must have a great voice and that that is the only thing you must have. Now, I have nothing against vocalists. I am one too. But creating great music takes more than vocals. It takes great musicianship, and it also takes great songwriting. Every season, American Idol would feature all these young, talented singers, and they would compete by singing covers of songs by artists like, say, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, or Paul McCartney. Now, the three artists I just mentioned are all great singers, to be sure, but they are also great musicians, and mostly, they're great songwriters. During the Simon Cowell era, musicianship was discouraged, and never was there any introspection into what kind of music that these contestants on the show could create on their own. Through this TV show, Simon Cowell told American audiences that it's all about the voice and that nothing else matters. And that's just not true. Songs matter. And with some artists, the songs are even more important than their vocal acrobatics. But worst of all, Simon Cowell turned music into a blood sport. Next is reality TV. Video may have killed the radio star, but reality TV, which is what eventually overtook MTV's focus in regards to programming, reality TV killed the music video star. I mean, why work hard 
to create great music or any kind of great art for that matter, when you can aspire to be like the Kardashians and basically be famous for nothing. Now, there have been some good examples of reality TV being educational, being useful, but for too long, I think a good majority of reality TV has been dominated by people who are basically famous for nothing. MTV eventually replaced music stars with reality TV stars. And as a result, the music became less important. The loss of music education. I think this is the most important of all of them. I cannot speak for other countries, but here in the United States, I feel that the loss of music education in our public schools contributed immensely to the devaluation of music and musicians. Let me give you an example. In school, every kid has to go to PE class, whether they want to or not. As a result, every kid gains and learns some sense of the amount of dedication, time, and training that it must take to become a world-class professional athlete. Now, I'm not into sports, but PE class instilled that into me, and it's something that I know and acknowledge about sports and athletics to this very day. Growing up, I may not have been the most ardent student of math and science, but encountering just how difficult these subjects were for me taught me to understand and respect the amount of work and dedication that it must take to become a skilled scientist or physicist. Music education has a similar impact, but when music education was cut off from our schools, kids stop gaining that sense for what it must take to become a world-class musician. We cut music education in our schools, which in turn created a generation of musical illiterates. As a result, music as an art form and as a skill lost respect. In addition, I think that reality TV and American Idol made fame more important than art. So there you have it. Those are what I feel are the seven cultural forces that have brought us to where we are now. But you know, this could always change. There's always hope. Um, like I said, you're watching this video. I know this audience here is really into music and I meet young people all the time who are really into music. And you never know who is suddenly going to just light that fire in the same way that the Beatles did, in the same way that Elvis did, in the same way that Jimi Hendrix did. And you never know what's gonna happen next. It could all change in the blink of an eye. But let me know what you think. Am I onto something or do you just think I'm on something? Leave a comment. If I didn't cover something, let me know what you think I should have. I definitely wanna read about that. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Keep listening to music and I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.